Hey, what's up, everybody? Hey, G. Hey, Dalton. Hey, Charlie. Hey, fellas. What's going on? All right. All right. So we got a different flow tonight, man. Um, I feel like the Lord is really like I, I seek the Lord all week on these studies. You know what I mean? And usually like the flow has been like deliverance and spiritual warfare and just like stuff like that. But I feel like this week it's important that we all sort of like study this together. And I just call this the servant's heart. OK, because this is what really defines us as Christians is that we serve and we know how to serve and we know what serving is. This is what separates us from the rest of the world. Right. And this is the example that Jesus gave us when he was alive and we follow Jesus. We don't serve. I know this sounds sort of vain, but like we don't serve for ourselves or even the people that we're serving. Rather, we serve for God. We serve God by serving others. OK, and it's 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 we're going to look at some different things. tonight. So let's start. Let's start with uh, John chapter 13. We're going to break this down because there's a lot wrapped up in this. And for those that don't know, this is where Jesus washed the disciples feet. OK. And he sets an example for us here. Um, and I want to talk. We're going to give some examples tonight. I know Craig's going to give some examples, some practical examples. And, and everything that's said here tonight, I don't want anybody to think like, oh, it's boasting. Because Matthew 5, 16 says, let your good works shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. There's time for you to do good works. And just keep it between you and the Lord and the people you're helping. There's a time for that. But there's a time, too, to let it be public so that people can glorify God by what you're doing. And people can pray for you. And people can help support you financially. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a time to do it on the low. And then there's a time to do it publicly, too. So we're going to sort of look at that also. It's just like prayer and fasting, right? There's a time where we fast and nobody knows. But there's also corporate fasting mentioned in Isaiah and the same thing with prayer. There's corporate prayer and there's personal prayer. It's the same thing with work. So let's go to John 13 and we're going to read a grip right here. And then we're going to go back and we're going to look at some key verses. All right. So we're going to read uh, verse one through uh, 17. And Chris, I know it's a lot, but could you hammer that out for us, bro? I got it. Cool. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it on the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. All right. There's a lot to unpack right there. Okay. So first off, right out the gate, 
we need to understand that true leadership is serving others. Okay. When we make ourselves low, it's an ups. God's kingdom is upside down from this world. God tells us over and over that if you want to be greatest in the kingdom of God, you're going to be a servant to all men, right? The world, what does the world tell you? The world tells you, screw everybody, stab as many people over in the back as you can, make as much money as you can, because we know the God of this world is Satan. But remember when Jesus stood before Pilate, what did he tell Pontius Pilate? He said, I'm a, I, I'm a ruler of a kingdom you have no part in whatsoever, okay? And that's the kingdom of God. It's completely opposite of the world that we live in, this world that's ruled by sin and death. So true leadership is serving others, okay? Um, God's kingdom values are selflessness, not statute, not building yourself up, building others up, okay? Edifying one another, especially the broken, okay? Now, the washing of feet, it symbolizes the cleansing of sin. It's the process of sanctification. Because think about it. Let's think about it on a more spiritual level, right? Your feet have contact with earthly things, and they become dirty, especially in Jesus' time. They didn't have shoes like we did. They wore like old leather sandals, and a lot of poor people were straight up barefoot or wore like rags on their feet. So they're, they have some dirty feet, right? But more than that, the washing of the feet nowadays to us, it symbolizes this world of sin and death. And Jesus washing the feet, it's like... A, it's showing us, bro, it's like the process of sanctification, right? That Jesus cleanses us from that sin and death. Because when we were born, we were born into this cursed world. It's cursed, bro. We all start dying the minute we're born. And true life only begins when, when we leave this body. That's when real life begins. This isn't life, man. This is like a, a test, a building up, a preparation for things to come. This whole world is all going to, everything in this world is going to be destroyed. The earth's going to fail, right? Everything on it's going to die and God's going to recreate it. That's what the whole end of the Bible's about, the new heaven and the new earth. So Jesus gives us this beautiful washing of the feet to symbolize, right? That process of sanctification, that cleaning us, how Jesus cleaned his disciples' feet. From that, he washed that dust, that dirt, that earth, that cursed earth off their feet. And that's what the example he gives to us that we should serve others with that heart of a servant, right? That same heart that Christ had. So I want to look at like a couple verses out of this whole portion of scripture that just sort of pop. So like verse four, right? Let's see. Verse four says, uh, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself, okay? So laying aside the outer garment, Jesus sort of signifies putting off himself. And to gird oneself in scripture uh, over and over, the girding, you know, we have the belt of tr truth that girds our waist. It signifies to be bound or restricted with humility, okay? So it's like a symbol of humility that Jesus gives us when he, he takes his clothes off, lays himself aside, and girds himself and prepares to serve by washing the disciples' feet. All right, verse 5, this is cool, man, because he takes that water. Now, I always knew that water represented the Word of God because it's in the Word over and over, the washing of the Word of God, right? And even in the Old Testament, you had the priests that ministered, and what did they do before they went in the temple? They would wash in the bronze lavar, and that's a symbol of the Word of God, like, like practical, right? Say we're suffering, our walk's sucking, we're feeling lukewarm, we're really suffering temptation. Well, what's going to help you overcome that? Read your word, man. Spend like five or ten minutes and read your word. It'll help renew your mind to get your mind out of the world and into the word of God. It's the washing of the word. You just washed your mind in the word of God, right? But the water also signifies the Holy Spirit. You can look at Titus 3.5 for that. Um, and life. It represents life also. So we see that the water that Jesus uses represents, it represents the word, it represents water, and it represents life. I found that incredibly interesting. And overall, like what I get from John 13 
is that what Jesus is trying to teach us is obedience, service, and humility. And I want to know what, what are you guys gleaning from that scripture? Because we all got something different to bring to the table here, you know? Yes, good topic, Matthew, once again. And uh, I think that it's not easy to be humble as a man in a in a dirty, hairy type of, uh, you know, world that we live in. Amen, Arnie, yeah. Um, I thought that this tied into to two key things. So uh, like Arnie just alluded to, um, ego, like it, it's kind of impossible to have ego when you realize that a like you're not the one really like responsible for this like you're just blessed for any anything that you're doing and b anything that you are doing you're not doing it for yourself you're doing it for you know the father um so i think that that's it's that's kind of like something that made me understand uh the sin of ego a lot better is that the reason why it's so bad um at least my understanding of it is that uh the reason that it is so bad is because it's it's essentially like disrespecting the Lord um, because you're taking credit for what he's done and uh, how he's blessed you. And the other thing is that it kind of separates out like who, uh, you know, because some people will think that like, oh, well, you maybe you can like still go to heaven uh, even if you don't believe that, you know, Christ was the savior. And that also like isn't really true (laughs) because it like, if you're a good person, but you don't believe in God, then you're, you're not really (laughs) doing those things for the right reasons, right? Like you should be a good person and believe in God, because if you're doing both of those things, then you're doing it for the right reason. You're doing it for the Lord. You're not doing it for yourself. Right. So those are two things that I thought of. Good. Yeah. Amen, bro. Anybody else? Yeah, I just like what he said about ego. Uh, you know, it's not easy to conquer the ego. We have to do it on a daily basis, um, you know, continue to stir up and bring up humility. And I think it kind of takes a lifetime to uh, learn how to master the ego because being human beings, we can't totally get rid of it. I mean, we need a little bit of personality, character, ego, whatever you want to call it to, you know, function and push forth but uh mastering the ego it's like uh mastering yourself right Mm -hmm. yeah and that's i think why the lord is asking us to put our own needs and ego to die to that crap essentially so that we can serve others and it's to it's to glorify god and help people but also it helps us too to get rid of that ego like when god puts us in lowly situations right and that so we can help people it's like humbling of us as well, you know. G, you got something? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the the whole thing is about being a servant. I mean, when you think about it, you've got the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of heaven and earth coming to serve his own creation with humility and love. And, you know, it all ties into the joy and the peace of the Lord, because if somebody begrudgingly serves others, they're going to do it with an attitude, like going to a restaurant mm-hmm. and the, the the server's got a crappy attitude, spills spills your drink on you, you know what I mean? And and stuff like that. We have to, and, and that, that would be representative of somebody not having the joy of the Lord that's just doing it to, to just push through it. You know, but with with the mind of Christ, we can do all things and he changes our heart into wanting to serve others. And that becomes our mission. And we do that in given with whatever gifts God has given us in our professions and uh, with our work and, and, and things that we do. That's how we serve others, you know, and always being a representation of Jesus Christ is important in all types of adversity and and things like that because people see the spirit you know what i mean people see the spirit of god in in us and they also see it when it's not in someone those were yeah so you hit on something real like you just said something and and that was the next topic actually that i wanted to look at 
you just said that when we serve, we need to serve with the joy of the Lord, right? And that's scriptural, bro. So let's go. Let's go to Psalm 100. And it's cool. I'm glad you brought that up, dude. Amen. Because it's true. Like, think about Paul talks about when we give, like financially to help any ministry, right? Whatever. Mm -hmm. He says, do it with, with joy out of the, your abundance of your heart. Because mm -hmm. God loves a cheerful giver. Well, when you serve, you're giving your time, you're giving your emotions, you're giving of yourself to help somebody else out, right? So it's like a form of giving. So it's important that when we do that, we have the joy of the Lord and not be like you said, I'll be grudging. That's, that's a good point, bro. Amen. Praise so, God. So, Psalm 100. G, you want to read those five verses? The main text I'm, I want to focus on when you're done is sure. verse two. Okay. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Amen. So verse 2 right there where it says, serve the Lord with gladness. Okay, I looked up that word serve in the Hebrew, right, to break it down, to get a better understanding of what it means to have a ser servant's heart, right? And that word right there in, in Hebrew is abad, and the number is 5647. The definition means literally to work for, to do labor for somebody. It means worship also, which I thought was really cool. Uh, and the root word of it goes back to labor or slave, or servant. But I thought it was interesting that the Hebrew definition for serve is worship. So our serving is a form of worshiping God, right? You're giving up what you got to build somebody else up, and you're doing it, in, and like Dalton said, in God's name, right? You're building others up for his kingdom. That's like a form of worshiping God when your heart and mind are all in line with the Lord and you're doing it from a right place. See, the problem is you got a lot of people, bro. They think they're saved by their serving, right? They think they can like earn favor with God or they, some people are even confused enough. They think that their salvation comes through this too, which is wrong, right? But when your relationship with Jesus Christ is right, he's good, bro. And he lives inside of you. So you're going to be like a cup overflowing with his presence it's, it's just good things are just going to come out of you. It's not you. It's the God who lives inside of you. That's his nature is good. So you're going to serve people. You're going to do good things, man. That's just the, you know, that's just him, bro. It's And you can tell, like you were saying, brother, you can tell when somebody's for real and when somebody's like trying way too hard in their own strength, they're not led of the spirit. It's just like everything's forced. Nothing flows. You know what I mean? So we just got to make sure that our heart and our mind is right first before we go out serving, because we got to, you know, make sure God's leading us in our serving by his spirit. Like he'll, if you want to serve the Lord, bro, and you tell the Lord, Lord, I want to serve you so bad. He might tell you, okay, go wait at this bus stop and somebody can come up to you broken and crying and want to commit suicide. And then you just feel the Holy Spirit and, and speak life into that person and totally change their life. That's like serving the Lord, being led of the spirit. You know what I mean? So we just got to be led and we just got to make sure that our relationship's right, you know, and in, in, in how we serve him. You guys got anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, Matthew. Um, yeah, I'll say that again, you know, what we think are our good works are actually the Holy Spirit working through us. It's not our good works. It goes back to we're saved through the blood of Christ. Uh, the Holy Spirit and dwelling in us is not our good works. And even the things that we do, the only way we're able to do them is it's the Holy Spirit working through us. And without that Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be able to do anything good. So the goodness in mm -hmm. us is the Holy Spirit working through us. Without the Holy Spirit, we're nothing. Hey, you mind if I testify real quick, Craig, of what you got going on? Uh, Yeah, fine. 
Okay, so Craig has a, a servant's heart, guys. And like when Craig, I've seen Craig serve before, and he has like this uh, childlike joy. And it's funny how God God gives us the desires of our heart, right? And uh, brother just had like some knee surgery, and he wanted to help with the hurricane relief stuff. But because he had knee surgery, he couldn't really do too much. But Craig can drive a side-by-side -side like crazy good, bro. So God presented an opportunity for Craig to roll with like a group of guys to road like ATVs and side-by-sides into the mountains and haul food and supplies to the people that are hurting in the mountains right now. And I thought it was awesome because it's like, I see Craig's heart, you know, like that, that, that joy he gets when he serves and he loves to ride and stuff. It's just, I thought it was really cool that God took the thing that Craig likes to do and presented an opportunity to be like, serve me doing this. You know what I mean? And it's, it's awesome, man. So yeah. I thought that was cool. It, it, it was actually, uh, you know, really, I, I really felt God working through it because uh, I just had a total knee replacement six weeks ago. And I've just now, you know, I can walk without a cane now, but, you know, I, I can't do anything other than, you know, kind of stumble around, but I can drive a, a side by side or, you know, whatever. And uh, ironically, I didn't even really think of being able to do that and be of any service. But I was talking to my pastor at my Baptist church and he uh, he 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 just happened. I, I told him, I said, I'd love to help, but, you know, I can't really do anything with my knee out. And then a few days later, he called me and said they've got a team there uh, and they've got like a base camp with like hundreds of people there and that there's a big need to try to get food up into the mountains where the uh, roads are closed and they can't get uh, automobiles or you know trucks or whatever to it. And he said, if you can bring the side by sides and run them up there, you know, that would be awesome. You know, and it was really cool because that's something that I would really enjoy doing. And, uh, you know, God just laid that out you know, in front of me. So it was really a blessing. Uh, and again, it was all God. I mean, it never really occurred to me that that could even be something of any use. So I was really excited about it. Yeah, that's awesome, bro. You see what I, I mean? You, bro, for doing that too, man. That's, that's super important. I didn't mean to cut you off, Matthew, but that, that oh, really moved me that Craig did that because it's terrible what happened to those people and it is continuing out up there in uh, North Carolina. It's, it, it's it's disgusting but god bless you craig for doing that man for real praise god and i think and i think the uh my opinion is the the bottom line for a man is if he can take action the action is service and uh today i was traveling through montgomery alabama and uh i didn't see any burning bushes this morning but uh i was inspired by God to stop into Montgomery and evangelize for about an hour and a half. And then I moseyed on my way. But um, anyway, I think it's important to plant seeds, take action. And that is service to me. Amen. Yeah. And you see what I'm saying, guys, how like God, when you're led of the spirit, God just sort of opens doors like you. All you have to do. It's just joyfully walk through the door and God lines everything up for you. And you can tell when somebody's faking it because they have to open the door themselves, right? They got to make all the provision. Everything's difficult. Nothing works. It's all a big mess, right? Because they're doing it in their own strength. We got to be led by the spirit, man, and let God open these doors for us. I think it's pretty cool what Craig's doing too, man. And if we could just keep them in our prayer, keep them in your prayers and that team he's working with, that they get to the right people who need to be ministered to and who need help. That'd be awesome, you know? Yeah. Amen. So let's jump now to, uh, let's go to Matthew 19. Can I share one thing? Yeah, Charlie. Uh, yeah, so we're, you're talking about being led by the Spirit, but I guess you were working on your vehicle there. It was around the same time I was, and he gave me a call. And you were pretty quick to, uh, every time I talk to you, I want to be truthful, right? So you're like, how's it going? How's the marriage going and stuff? And pretty probably the Holy Spirit was like, well, you know, how is it going? So I said, you know, I smoked weed again. I don't really want to do that. And right away you prayed with me and that stayed with me. So then you said, be careful because you might be tested in a couple of days. Anyway, a bunch of friends were down and, 
it was getting later in the night and they started smoking weed and stuff. And I just remembered, you know, what you said, plus other things that had happened during the week. And I was just like, okay, no, I'm not going to do that again. And we went to church today and we got up and told this little testimony, but I even said my friend, Matthew, you know, he encouraged me. So then we sat down and then this other girl got up and she was like, so sincere she said you know i really have been struggling with smoking and and she shed some tears and she just said i've been playing uh the bible app and i've been spending time in prayer uh listening she said that i want to get closer to god and she just kind of knew that that was something that was keeping her back and and she said i'm just grateful to know that I'm not the only one struggling and that we can tell each other these things and overcome it. Mm-hmm. So I believe, you know, you're serving when you're paying attention to the Holy spirit. It might be something like that, but you don't realize how that little seed can cause, you know, a big kind of effect amongst the other believers. It was awesome. Amen, brother. Yeah, that's that. Yeah. God's ways are not our ways, bro. Like the Bible says that his thoughts are are higher than the heavens compared to us. So that's why like one of the key things too with with serving is obedience. You know what I mean? Because God will tell you to do something and it may not really make sense all at the moment, but later on it will make sense, right? There's even a scripture that says that. It says if, if you commit your works unto the Lord, he shall establish your thoughts, meaning When the work comes to your heart, you don't even know in your mind what the heck's going on, but you know the Lord is pushing you in a direction, right? And the Bible says that as we commit those works to the Lord, he establishes our thought process as we walk it out with them, you know? So yeah, Charlie, absolutely. And another thing too, you fulfilled that scripture in, uh, what is that, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins one to another, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a beautiful thing, bro. It is very beautiful. It's very encouraging. Amen, brother. All right, let's jump over to... uh... And Matthew, can I interject one thing? Yeah. Uh, You know, in our humanity, it's not always easy to, uh, you know, hear from God because there's so much noise in the world. And I don't know if anybody's going to understand this. Maybe some of you will. But, uh, you know, sometimes I hear from God. Sometimes I... uh, you know, I grab some posters, I go out, I grab some tracks, and I just go out and push the doors open, and then see what the uh, see what the Holy Spirit does. But um, I am a man of action, and I I uh, I take action because I know that the uh, the devil's taking action in this whole world, so I take action too. Yes, yeah, a in good the reminder. Name, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Matthew 19, we're going to read 28 through 30, and I want to focus on the last verse, which is 30. And this is Jesus talking. Um, Brother Gray, can you read that for us, bro? Of course. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones judging 12 tribes of Israel and anyone and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Okay. That's the key I want to look at here is this mystery that Jesus gives us, right? He says, many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And I mean, this is sort of confusing. It's very sort of confusing when you look at it, right? But like what Jesus is saying is he's saying. It came on it. What's that? John? Oh, I thought I was muted. I'm sorry. (laughs) You're good, bro. Uh, My fault. All right. so, So when we reach for the last. We're putting God first. You see what I mean? It's not that you're like coming in last and that you're failing, but it's like, like Jesus, nobody took his life. He gave it as a gift. He willingly laid it down. And that's what essentially he's telling us to do. 
You come in last that God may be put first in all things. You're lifting God up rather than yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. And when he's talking about like this rewards thing, yeah, it's like the rewards he's talking about are given by he like heaven standards, not earth's. And that's what the parable he goes into in chapter 20 is all about, right? The different, how all the dudes that labored, they all got the same reward, right? Some came early, some came late. It didn't really matter in the end. They all got the same wage and reward. So, um, yeah, there's that. So we got, you know, rewards is a, rewards is a, is a, is a subject. I don't know, man. The way I feel about it is like, again, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. The heart needs to be right with God, right? Because rewards is great and all, but if you're serving God for rewards only, then there's something wrong in your heart. You should be serving God just because you love God and you're thankful for what God's done for you in your life and you want to build his kingdom up. You shouldn't be serving God to like get something out of it. That's sort of selfish in nature. You know what I mean? It's good that we get blessed. Don't get me wrong, but it shouldn't be our main heart motive is what I'm trying to say. So like the rewards that Jesus is talking about are given out by heaven standard, not what we perceive to be earthly good, because our ways are not God's ways again. And in the Proverbs, it says it like five times. It says there's a way that seems right unto a man and its end is in death. So God's re idea of rewards and our idea of rewards are two totally different things. Right. We think of rewards. We think of like a, a, a house, like a mansion and a nice car and money and things like that. When God's talking about rewards, he's talking about giving you contentment, that you can be content looking at yourself in the mirror, that you can have faith to move mountains, that you can have self-control. Like that's God's idea of rewards. But we don't even think like that. You know what I mean? So it's, it's an interesting concept to think about. Um. Does anybody want to say anything to that before we move on? That was well yeah, said, bro. Well said. <laughs> Amen. I, I just like to comment, brothers. I, I mean, it's easy to say that, you know, all the rewards are going to be the same. But when I get to heaven, I'm sure Moses, John the Baptist, Elijah, they're going to have different places in heaven than we are going to have. So uh, I think that uh, even Jesus said that... Uh, you know, it's not given to me who's going to sit on the right hand or left hand of the Father. So I think there is there is heavenly rewards, and uh, it's kind of all hard to understand all this. But uh, I don't know. I don't want my money back. I uh, I'm a happy camper. I'm a happy camper on this on this team. <laughs> Amen, Arnie. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's jump over to Revelation nineteen five. So um, when G brought that thing up about, you know, serving the Lord with with joy, we looked at the Hebrew definition to serve out of the Old Testament. Now we're going to look at the Greek definition out of the New Testament. So let's go to Revelation 19, 5. Um, let's see. Andy, could you read that? Revelation 19, 5. Yeah, I got it. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. All right. So right there, the word in Greek is doulos for servants, and it's Strong's exhaustive number 1401. Now in the Greek, the definition for the word servant means literal obedience, loyalty, and devotion. I thought that was weird, like the devotion word. And sort of cool because, like, you know, when I get up in the morning, I like to read Proverbs and Psalms, and I call that my devotion, right? So I guess in, like, a weird way, like, spending time with the Lord, that's a way we could serve them, too, to help benefit our walk with them is when you guys get up, do your devotion, man. If that's prayer, worship, or reading the word, whatever that is, keep your devotion, you know? That's part of being disciplined, you know? Um, we're going to show our, um, our, uh, we're just going to show the Lord that we're trying to be obedient and, um, continuing to do that. So. Absolutely. Yeah, it's good, man. And that discipline is, is crucial, man. Cause I like to, I really like to preach like the, uh, nine fruits of the Holy spirit, Galatians five, you know, the love, joy, peace, all that. The last one being self-control. And as a man, 
that really is like the hardest fruit <laughs> to cultivate for the Lord is self-control. You know, it's very hard, but disciplining helps to cultivate that when you can discipline your diet, you can discipline your reading time, your prayer time, heck, even serving, right? You can put aside time that you're going to serve. Like all of this is good ways to exercise that fruit of self-control and discipline, man. And it's also important to realize that most people by default, they want to take the path of least resistance. They want to take the easiest path imaginable. Just accept that, like be a man, accept the fact that you're going to have to go through hard stuff and start denying yourself. Like tell yourself, I'm not going to have coffee today because I need to show my body and to show my flesh who's boss. So that's, that's another <laughs> important component, I believe. Yeah, that's good, Chris. I think it was Dalton last week said that uh, he stopped watching his phone and social media. Is that correct, bro? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it was. I, I was saying it in the context of something that Arnie was saying earlier. Was that there's just there's so much noise, and I felt like uh, media, especially social media, like everything on your phone. Um, it's basically like I mean, how can you expect to like? How, if you want to hear from God, how can you expect to hear him if you got all this other noise going on, you know? Mm. And it is hard. Hey, that's a good it's one. It's worth it. Yeah, that oh, one man. really takes a lot of self-control in this day and age. Because, like, you know how that phone, I guess it releases, like, dopamine or whatever? So you're, you're you just, like, yeah, you crave that, bro. Yeah. You know, for me, uh, discipline is the path to power. But, uh, you know, I'm not happy all the time, but, uh, you know, I do my duties as a man. I have responsibilities and duties that I have to do, and I just do them. I don't uh, whine and complain about them. I'm, I'm glad I'm living in a free country and that, uh, you know, I got a roof over my head, three square meals a day, and I just do my duties. But uh, as far as getting high, I try to get high on life. I'm not getting high on alcohol or drugs, but am I happy all the time then? No, I'm not happy all the time, but I'm happy that uh, I'm happy I'm on God's team. Amen, Arnie. All right, let's let's um uh, let's wind this down tonight with one more large portion of scripture, and then we're gonna break it down line upon line and uh see what Jesus is talking about. So we're gonna we're gonna read the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Some of you guys are familiar with this. Some of you guys aren't. But there's some nuggets that we can pick out of this to help us in our heart of serving. So uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 25. And it's going to be a bulk read again. It's going to be verse uh, 31 to 46. We'll see. Uh, Curtis, could you read that for us? Yes, I will. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, and then he will sit on his glorious throne, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, and the goats on his left, or on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you for a blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty, and give you something to drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or naked, and clothe you? When did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, 
and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's some heavy scripture right there, bro. So that which we do to the least of these, we do unto Jesus, right? Like that's a heavy word, bro. Like as much as you, like say you have an enemy in your life, right? <laughs> as, as good as you treat that enemy, it's like you're doing it unto Jesus, right? We have to love like unconditionally, okay? Because it's how, it's like a reflection of how we do it to the Lord. Let's look at the things that are listed there, right? He says, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, visit the prisoner, clothe the naked, and giving alms to the poor, okay? So he's giving us some examples of how God can use you to serve him right there. He's laying it out for you. And he's saying that what you've done to the least of these You've done unto me that right there, bro. I don't know about you guys, but that's a heavy scripture, man. Like me and my wife, we focus a lot on homeless drug outreach because I was there for 17 years. So I know what it's like to sit in that gutter with a needle in your arm. But man, you really see it when you do that kind of street ministry. And Arnie, Arnie's the one who like trained me a lot of, of doing street ministry. And man, you deal with a lot of crazy stuff and like garbage. And sometimes you're just like, man, what am I doing? But then it's super rewarding too, because you have these like moments where you really like, you'll, you'll just like not even paying attention. You'll just bless somebody with something like some socks and be like, Hey man, Jesus loves you. And, and they'll start crying and just break down and just be like totally wide open in the spirit. And you can start praying over them. And so it's crazy, man, when you, when you really serve the Lord like that, you know what I mean? I just wanted to share the scripture with you guys to just sort of reflect on the things that Jesus is listing there and just keep that in mind, dude. Like next time you see a bum asking for change or, or whatever that God, like that God will put in your heart, man, maybe, maybe that person, maybe you don't have a dollar to give him. Maybe he just needs somebody to talk to, just go talk to the brother and be like, Hey, how you doing, man? What's going on? You know what I mean? Sometimes a lot of these homeless guys, they just need somebody to listen, man. And that's how we can serve God is just just to shut up and listen to somebody for a bit. You know what I mean? And that that can change their heart right there, man. What do you guys think about that, Matthew 25? You know, uh, Matthew, uh, one thing, too, with the spiritual connotations, uh, being hungry for the bread, being thirsty for the water, being a prisoner, uh, you know, a prisoner with um, sin or you know, different evils. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it can go both ways too. uh, you know, what in revelations, when they're talking about the churches, uh, you know, one of them, it says that, uh, you know, you're rich and, you know, all this, but you're really poor, you know, uh, mm. so, uh, you know, this could be, um, uh, uh, just somebody that needs the word and needs the gospel. Yeah, I've heard that, you know, the, the wheat and the tares is God's judgment between the believers and the unbelievers. And then that this judgment that we just read, the sheep and the goats is how God's going to judge the believers. Right. These are people that believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And when I, when I was driving around uh, Montgomery today with putting up my posters, when I saw the homeless, I, uh, you know, I stopped. I gave them some crackers, gave them some tracks. Give him my 30 second testimony and, uh, you know, moved on. So I, uh, I plant seeds wherever I go. And I think that's an important thing that we're supposed to be doing for God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. I mean, this, this scripture here is literally the gospel to feed the mm -hmm. hungry, to take care of the poor, visit those in prison, the stranger, and it's all throughout God's word. I mean, this isn't just New Testament stuff. This is all you can go back to Genesis and find that this is the way we are supposed to treat each other, love each other, and take care of this world. 
that God has given us the stewardship over. And, you know, it's amazing to see that this is the heart of God, to be so caring, because the heart of the devil is the complete opposite, you know, mm -hmm. and we see that in this world every single day, no matter where we turn, you know, I mean, you can literally go online now and watch somebody get murdered. It's disgusting. And, it, and people laugh. They comment in the thousands. You know, how would they feel if that was their sister or their father or their son? How would they feel about that? It, it's always a different story when the shoe's on the other foot and it affects that person. So that's why Jesus, the God of everything, said to take care of the least of these. Because that little one is me. And what you do to that one will reflect in the world to come. And I think it's very important, Matthew, like you said, that this here in 25 is a judgment upon the church, not against the unbelievers and the believers, like the wheat and tares, the sheep and the goats. And this goes back to Leviticus, when the uh, Israelites would let the Azazel, they call it, the scapegoat, go and put all the sins of Israel for that year on that goat. Well, at some time, God comes to collect a check, and that check is the payment is judgment. And none of us could pay that price. The blood of Jesus Christ already paid that price for all of us. So we need to accept it. We need to get the Holy Spirit in us and live with the heart of God, the heart of flesh that he has given us. And act accordingly, like Arnie was saying, plant them seeds. No matter where we find ourselves in the world, plant the seeds, plant them, because God will give the increase. Somebody else will come along and water what you planted. You know, it's very important. Very important, guys. Amen, bro. Well said, G. You know, I, uh, anybody else? I, I was going to say, I've heard you talk a few times, G, but I was thinking to myself, and I was going to write all throughout God's word. <laughs> but in my head, I was thinking, the, the God has given G a, a heart of flesh. And I accidentally wrote all throughout God's. And then you were saying God's heart. At the exact time I wrote it and realized I wrote it wrong all throughout God's heart and word, but it's just nice to hear all that, uh, you know, Amen. you can tell that he's, uh, he's in your heart and it's, it's awesome. Praise Praise yeah. yeah. And I think, you, and I think you men will probably agree with me that, uh, you know, we're not on Matthew's Bible study to learn to be mediocre or even average. We're here to, <laughs> Train for excellence and train for greatness. Uh, we live in a fallen world and most people just get sucked into the, you know, television and the media. But uh, I feel like I'm on here to train for excellence and excellence and um, also greatness. Amen, Arn. Praise God. So serving God. We serve God by serving others, and it allows us to develop and cultivate spiritual gifts. So say you're struggling with this because we covered this a few weeks ago. Remember we went over the nine spiritual gifts? If you still can't figure out what those gifts are, a good way to tap into that is start serving, okay? When you put others first above your own needs, God will start to manifest those gifts in your life, right? It allows us to experience miracles. We can look at Stephen's life for that, right? Um, we become more like Jesus when we serve. It increases our faith when we serve. Um, if you're dry, it will allow you to experience God's presence. And it's good for your soul, man. What's our soul, G? What three our, things? Our soul is our emotions. It is our mind. And uh, what would be what? Uh, the will. The will, that's right. That's right. The will. Yeah. So it, it benefits your mind, your will, and your emotions yeah. when you serve God, right? Amen. Because, bro, we live in an emotional world and everything mm. plays on your emotions, bro. And God's telling you to shut them emotions off, crucify them to the cross, and focus on Him. So, a good way to practice doing that is to get up and go serve, man. It crucifies that stuff, you know? Amen. Amen. All right. Does anybody got any final thoughts or anything tonight before we wrap this up? I, I had one final thought. Um, 
I always struggled with being intentional, you know, right at the on, at the moment on the spot, serving others, especially when you see somebody in need. And, um, you know, I live in a rural area. I'm not like near a big city or anything. I don't I'm not in the trenches. I don't see the uh, the um, the things that a lot of people see, like you do, Matthew, when you're in the trenches, you're seeing that every day, pretty much. We don't, you know, where I live, we don't really, a lot of things that are happening in the world hasn't really reached my area. <laughs> and I think um, if he's from Vancouver, he might, I mean, the guy from Vancouver there, I don't know if he, if he's in a rural area or not, but um, Charlie, but um, where I live in upper Michigan, we're away from uh, metropolitan type areas and we don't really see the things that you do near the cities. And, um, but as far as being intentional, do you have any words of wisdom for like, um, how to go about being intentional, um, and serving others? Yeah, that's a good question, bro. I, I honestly, um, I would just say to pray and ask the Lord to direct you to be led of the spirit, right? Because you can think of like 20 things in your mind right now that you can do to go serve God. But what is God telling you to do? That's the most important question. Because God will put you, like I, like I was saying earlier, in the path of that suicidal person, right? God will put you right. Maybe somebody's about to make a big mistake in their life. You'll just happen to bump shoulders with that person while you're out serving the Lord. You know what I mean? So the most important place to be like to just be intentional to serve God is just pray and ask the Lord to put you. You know what? You know what is a good thing to pray for is that me and my wife always pray for is for divine appointments that God will line up a divine appointment and, and put that together. Right. And the devil will try to like separate that. He'll try to mess everything up. So you don't, you don't run into that one person, bro. Like whenever we go out on the streets, like we're leaving on um, Thursday or Friday to go back out and we'll go city by city. When we hit a city, we hand out like probably like two, three hundred socks to the masses. But before we went out on the streets, we prayed for 20, 30 minutes for that one person, that one divine appointment that God will line it up. And it always every time. I don't think the Lord has never not answered that prayer, bro. We always have one special occasion where like as soon as you meet this person, Curtis, you'll get like Holy Spirit chills all over your body. Like, you know that God just lined this up and the Holy Spirit will bring confirmation. That right there is like the sweet spot to serving the Lord, bro. That's where you want to be. You know what I mean? So pray for those divine appointments and pray and shut your flesh off and your mind to be led by the spirit, you know, and not your own strength. Amen. You know, it also makes me think of in Proverbs where it says in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So I'm really That's just going first and trust him. Amen, brother. For me, I, uh, I check I check in with the news every day and I see the evil that goes on. The uh, all the young people that are dying from fentanyl and overdoses, all our young kids, boys and girls being abducted for, uh, you know, sex slavery or whatever. So I I see the evil every day. So I uh, I fight on a regular basis. I fight almost uh, not every day. There's some days I'm taking days off of working, but I fight on a regular basis. And uh, God, Jesus said, hey, the fields are white and they're ripe and they're ready to harvest. So uh, all I got to do is go out there and take action. Amen, Arn. All right. Hey, Curtis, would you do us a solid tonight, brother? And um, could you pray us out tonight, bro? Father God, we just come before you humbly and we just thank you for this uh, meeting. And this gathering together, um, your remnant um, of believers and fellow brothers here, just we're so thankful that um, you uh, bring us together from um, from the four um, ends of the earth to um, you bring together uh, people that are like minded in Christ and um, are uh, here to serve you, Father, and um, just help us um, tomorrow to. Um, um serve you um better than we did today and um we just ask father that the holy spirit keeps um directing 
our path and in everything that we do. And it's all to serve you, Father, and to glorify your name and to be the light of Christ to a dying um, world. And um, we just pray, Father, in the um, in your um, holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah, guys. Have a blessed week.